In this video, we're going to take an in-depth look at the Bushcraft Essentials Bush Box Outdoor Pocket Stove. If you're interested, keep watching. So I am out in the woods today, and I will be building a fire in the Bush Box in a few minutes' time. But I wanted to do, though, to start, was to take this down to the tabletop at home so I can give you a lot of specifications, show you how it goes together, show you how it is supposed to be used with wood, show you how it can be used with a lot of alternative fuels. And then I'll bring in some footage of the fire being built in the stove. Okay, I thought what we'd do is start with the assembly of the stove. So I just want to point out this is not the case that the stove arrived in to me from Germany. It did come in a small cotton stuff sack, which was more than sufficient to keep the stove together in one place. It, you know, it's functionally just fine. What I wanted to do is make a more permanent case for it. This is a temporary case that I made out of an old barbecue cover, which is working fine. I may leave it in this. Bushcraft Essential did send it along a couple of stickers, which I put on the front of it. I think it just adds to the look. Hopefully you can see that. All right, so what do we have. So inside we have our number of plates that will go together. Bring them all out. To start with we have a front plate identified by the feed port, back plate, the other shorter plate without the feed port, two identical side plates, a pair of pot stands, fire grate, ash pan. So to assemble the stove start with the back plate, the shorter of the two side plates or the shorter of the two plates, and you're going to hook them together on the edges with the tabs and slotted tabs that they have here. What I would like to point out though is something very clever that Bushcraft Essentials did to help them stay together. Right where the tip of my finger is, you should be able to see a small projection out over the slot. That actually helps, combined with the springiness of the steel, to lock these plates in place. Now you do have to be cautious, just the same. I'll give you some more hints on keeping it together when we go along. So start by holding the back plate, take the side plate. You should be able to actually hear this lock into place and snaps into place like that. Same with the other one. All right, so they've snapped into place. Now I'm going to take my ash pan and my fire grate, and there are two provided slots in either of the side plates that match up with the two tabs on the ash plate and the fire grate. So I'll slide those into place. Like all stoves of this design, it does take a little bit of practice to get somewhat proficient at it. All right, hold it upright, holding it to from the sides, either side with my hand. Take the front plate, line it up. It's usually the last plate that gives people, me included, the most challenge. There, it's locked into place. And now I can set on the two pot supports. All right, so that's the fully assembled stove. Let's do a few specifications on it the way it's assembled right now. So, of course, I am going to be putting all the information I'm giving you now in the video description below. So, to begin with, this is the stainless steel version of the stove, and Bushcraft Essentials does now make a titanium version of the stove, which I think would be a great purchase, considering for its size, this is a fairly heavy stove. That weight is due to the fact that there's a lot of good solid stainless steel being used in this, good thick stainless steel, I should say. So the weight overall is 8.9 ounces or 255 grams. The height of it from the floor to the top of the pot stands is 4.5 inches or 11.5 centimeters. The width, and I'm talking about the width of the burden chamber, not with the extended width of the tabs, is 3 and 1 eighth inches or 8 centimeters. And the burn chamber depth from the pot stands to the fire grate is also 3 and 1 eighth inches or 8 centimeters. Okay, so that's the overall de description of this stove in its intended design. So what we're going to do is just talk about how it can be used with wood first, how we can do some weight savings on this, and some other alternative setups for wood. So obviously the way the stove is designed, it has the higher placed feed port, very common to the German design stoves that I have reviewed, in contrast to most of the American ones which have a feed port that is low to the bottom. There are pros and cons for both and it's a matter of what you prefer. I kind of like this, I, I prefer the, I, it's not that I prefer the, the American design over the, uh, the German design, I just find that they're different, they both have the pros and cons as I said. So the way you would use a stove, of course, Normally, is that you would cut your sticks, start your fire, and feed in through that window. The advantage is that it's very easy to feed sticks in through the stove and put them in on top of the fire. There's no trying to make sure that they come up from underneath and go over top of the fire. Now, obviously the disadvantage is long sticks. If you want to feed long sticks into this stove, there can be a bit of a challenge. I'll show you what I mean. If I feed a long stick in longer, that's much longer than the burn chamber is wide, 
they want to fall out. So there is a bit of a disadvantage there. And in addition, as the wood is being consumed inside the firebox, that makes the outside part even heavier and it's going to tend to drop. So really, sticks much longer than this is about five inches. Sticks much longer than that are not a good choice. You want most of the stick fitting in the firebox. A medium length stick like this one is working. When you get to about this length, you have to keep an eye on it because of course it does get heavy on the outside. Just keep an eye on it and keep pushing them in. The alternative is, of course, with the American design, where you can feed it in through the bottom, is you can take longer sticks, which means less processing, slide them in from the bottom, and just continually push them in. Um, it's six of one, half a dozen another, I guess the expression is, is whichever you prefer. So this is the traditional way that this stove is to be used. Let me show you a few modifications, not so much modifications, but alterations in the way it's assembled, which you can save you both some weight and maybe increase your performance. So to do that, take the first one, is to take the pot supports off. Now here's just a little trick for disassembling the stove. The way it assembles with those two little locking lugs, the easiest way to disassemble the stove is to grab it by the top of the feed port, pull out slightly, and I don't, I just mean slightly, so it bypasses those little locks and lift up. If I found that out the hard way, <laughs> I honestly, when I first got it, I did struggle a little bit to figure that trick out. Uh, take out the ash pan, and the fire grate. Now, to save a little bit of weight, you can actually leave the ash pan out and just reassemble it the way that it would normally go together, but without the ash pan. All right, so it's blocked back together. Now, at this point, the stove moves from 8.9 ounces to 7.5 ounces. So you have a fair amount of weight saving just by taking out the ash pan. Now, of course, that means you have to be even more cognizant or even more aware of what type of surface you have it on to make sure that the heat that's being transferred down isn't on something that might ignite. So make sure you're on either good mineral earth or a good stone that you will protect it from catching fire. All right, so that's one variation. It's a small one, but it does save you a little bit of weight. All right, the next thing that I want to point out is how you can actually increase the length of the, or the depth of the burn chamber. So once again, take the front plate off, take the fire grate out, and now put it in the slots that are intended for the ash pan. So let me see what I'm doing here. So by doing that, what I have done is I've created an even deeper firebox. And that deeper firebox means that I can put in slightly longer sticks with less worry of them falling out of the stove. So it means a little less wood processing. The other advantage, of course, is that I've now increased airflow quite dramatically at the bottom because I have an opening underneath each of the two, the front and the back, so I can get some additional airflow. It also means, of course, that the fire is closer to the earth now, so you do have to be, again, careful about what's underneath it. So the other advantage I've discovered in doing this is this kind of turns it into a bottom feed stove, not for very big sticks, but you can start to feed sticks in from the bottom from both sides and have that cross action that, that uh, we quite often use in sto stoves like the firebox and the emberlet. Okay, so that is another way of using the stove for wood. So I have a friend on YouTube. He is a fellow YouTube content creator. His name is K Dog Crazy. Uh, he came up with an alternative arrangement that I want to share with you now. So let me take the stove apart one more time. And K Dog Crazy assembled the stove without either the fire grate or the ash pan. So once the stove is assembled, he flipped it upside down. Now, it is a little bit wobbly, but it's still connected. Placed it on top of a piece of tin foil on top of the earth for fire protection. And now he has a bottom feed, a large bottom feed that he can feed sticks in through. And it still works very well. So it has airflow along all around the bottom. I expect if you'd had an extended feed, you would start to build ashes up in there, but uh, that's, that's pretty easy to, to resolve. You just move it. So that's an alternative that way of using it. So a couple of things while it's in this position, in the inverted position, something I want to show you. I can't remember if K Dog Crazy showed this or not, but if you have it in this position and you did bring your fire grate with you, you could drop it in on top of the inverted legs and you have a small grill. Small enough for, well, not a big hamburger, but a reasonable size hamburger. You could uh, use that right there. You can also use that as a pot support for a small container, something like the Stanley Adventure cook set would fit on top of that and would still, uh, you know, still be well supported. 
You can also do that if you have the fire grate removed and you use the stove in its upright position right at the top of the back and the front panels are the same tiny cutouts which will allow your fire grate to sit on top. So even if you're using it with just the ash pan and in the bottom uh, and rather than the fire grate you could use the fire grate on top for a grill. So that's just another option to show you there. Okay so let's uh, talk about using the stove with wood one more time. I will assemble it back in its original position for this. So let's just talk for a minute about the intended use of this stove and where it fits in with you and who is this intended to be used by. I have heard other reviewers comment that it is too small and my reaction to that is too small for what? Well it certainly is too small for cooking large meals for a number of people. Really this stove is designed for cooking for one person, maybe two, certainly boiling water for two it's it's you know you can get a full liter or a quart of water to a boil quite quickly with this small stove but uh, cooking for large numbers of people three four people there's other stoves that are better designed for that so for a one-person stove this works very well you can certainly boil all the water you need to and you can cook with fry pans or whatever else you want on top it's strong enough to support a Dutch oven or a cast iron fry pan I'm not sure that that is the right thing to use on top of this but you could do that if you wanted to do it now the other thing is about using it with wood so there are two ways of building fires in a small wood stove the more traditional way is to start start a small starter fire in the bottom on the fire grate and then start feeding sticks in on top of it. The other way which I use quite often, I have done it with the stove but I'll qualify that in a second, is to preload the stove with wood that is all cut to size that will sit inside of the fire chamber but not protrude out of the top. So completely fill the stove up. Then start a small fire on top which will burn down from the top through the wood. The advantage of that of course is there's less feeding of wood as it goes. It provides a steady consistent fire and heat and flame from the get-go. The disadvantage of it is it's very intense heat. Uh, that, that may be of a benefit if you're trying to boil large amounts of water, but that intense heat can have an impact on the stove itself. So Bushcraft Essentials advises against using the stove with what we often call as the Swedish torch style or the top-down burn style with a preload of wood. The recommendation is that you start it in the traditional manner with a small fire inside and then feed your wood in. You'll have plenty of airflow to have complete combustion of your wood and plenty of heat to get the job done without creating excessive heat which could cause warping to the stove. Let's talk about warping just for a second. So in my experience and I have tested a lot of stoves at this point I've only had one or two stoves that did not warp. It's just that simple. All stoves will warp if you apply enough heat to them over prolonged periods of time. This stove has some minor warping which I will show you in a second but it has not affected the performance of the stove. Warping is not a deal breaker when it comes to a stove. What you have to understand is how much does it warp and does it affect the performance of the stove? And the answer is most of the time for these type of stoves that are assembled in pieces like this, warping is easily managed because if it does to come way out of true and really start to bow out of shape, they're usually quite easy to either to bend into shape while they're cold or just flip the or invert the components so that the next time the fire you have a fire in it it pushes it back into true. So that's true of most of the stoves like this. Now some stoves have thinner metal more subject to warping. Uh, my Emberlet titanium it warps quite a bit. It doesn't affect the performance of it at all. It wobbles a little bit but once you get a fire going in it you put a pot on top it settles down it works just fine. There's nowhere near the warping in this stove that I've experienced in my Emberlet titanium and uh, it's there is some though I'll show you actually why don't I show you that right now so to do that the easiest place to show you is on the fire grate so I'm going to show you the ash pan because the ash pan looks like it's brand new uh, trust me I have been using it it's just that it's so well separated from the rest of the fire it doesn't get all dirtied by the fire like the fire grate does so it is flat and true hopefully I'm getting that at an angle to the but if you look at the fire grate it is a little bit warped. Now, yeah, the warping is minor, but I've had a good number of fires in this. The next time, if I felt that this was starting to find, you know, finding it difficult to assemble the stove, flip it over, and then the fire will start to work its way down and start to straighten the plate out. So that's all I wanted to talk about in terms of warping.
All right, I'm going to set up in a second and we're going to talk about using the stove with alcohol. All right, let's talk about using the outdoor, or the Bushcraft Essentials outdoor pocket stove with alcohol. So it is intended to be used with an alcohol stove, primarily a Trangia or one of its clones. Uh, the stove that I use most often is a Nilox. I found it to be one of the best of the copies of the Trangia and uh, in terms of quality control that is. So how do you use this stove with it? Well it depends on how much distance you want to your pot. So if I drop in my cap which is the, probably the preferred way to do this, drop the cap in to get a little bit of height, then drop the burner in, put my pot, pot stands on and pot stands by the way have two position so you can have them setting it down a little lower setting a little higher depending on what you want I like to use it so that they sit a little higher on top of the stove just to give it a little bit of clearance above the stove for more exhaust room especially when using wood now if I measure the pot gap the gap between the burner and where the pot would rest on the pot supports it comes in at one and one eighth inches so that's just over what a lot of people assume is the most magic number to me it's just about perfect I like one and a half to or excuse me one and an eighth to one and a quarter inches if you want to lower that you can flip your pot support over and you'll come right down to one inch. All right, with the position or the, the stove in that position and using a pot, and I thought I'd just put a pot in the picture here. This is my 12 centimeter zebra billy pot. I thought it would be a good reference for size and a pot that I would likely use on a stove like this. Now I can boil water, or I have boiled water, two cups of water in fact, with one ounce of fuel in seven minutes 20 seconds. Now that's not extremely fast for an alcohol stove but uh, to be quite honest I'm not concerned about speed when I'm using this out in the wood. We use speed measures as in terms of a comparison just for performance of the alcohol stove. That left me with some alcohol left in the bottom of the stove. I didn't measure it but I know that I didn't use the full ounce, ounce of alcohol in getting my water to boil. So that's one position. Now if you don't want to use the cap, you don't have to. Drop the burner in. Now when I put the pot stands on or the pot supports on, I have a distance from the burner to my pot of one and five eighths inch. So it's setting a little lower. At one and five eighths inches, so just over one and a half inches, using again one ounce of fuel and two cups of water, I got a boil in ten or seven minutes, ten seconds. Uh, better, but I also consume more alcohol. So that's the trade-off you get. You can get faster boils sometimes by re increasing the distance between the pot and the stove, but or the pot and the burner, but you usually trade off with a little bit faster alcohol consumption. So just wanted to point those two things off out. Now, I didn't use the ash pan. And uh, you don't have to use the ash pan in order to put the alcohol stove in. Your choice. It's just a, uh, you know, you can use either one of them, in fact, and just put one in if that's all you want to do at the time. Okay, so there is one small uh, hiccup or caveat, if you will, when it comes to using an alcohol stove with this little, or an alcohol burner with this little stove, and that has to do with the pot supports. So when the pot supports are in place, they cross over the top. Now that is still, you know, there's plenty of room for the flame to come up and come in contact with the pot. The problem is when it's time to snuff the stove out, they become quite difficult to get out of uh, the stove uh, in order to drop your snuffer inside. So a couple of thoughts. One is you don't really have to use them. You can use them directly on top of the uh, stove without the, the pot supports at this point and as long as your pot is large enough to extend it over the sides of the stove. So that's one way of doing it. If you have a smaller pot or a cup or whatever you're using, something like the Stanley Adventure, and you do want to be able to get these off. So you can lay them on top crosswise. And those little notches I showed you a minute ago where I placed the grate and turned it into a grill, they actually will hold the pot stands on in position quite well. And now, well, it was not supposed to drop inside, but you can get them off with a stick and just flip them out of the way, allowing you to drop your snuffer in to put your stove out. And you can also, of course, use the snuffer as, in this, as a simmering as it's intended to do by opening it to a certain amount, getting that inside, and you have room to use it. The one thing you can't do is you can't get in from the feed port like you can in some stoves to snuff it out. All right, so that's now using the Bushcraft Essential Outdoor Pocket Stove with alcohol. Now I'm gonna set back up and show you how it can be used with uh, solid fuels. 
Okay, so what I've done is I've partially disassembled the stove in order to show you how to use it with a Nesbit tab or other solid fuels. So I've taken the front plate off, fire grate out, and I'm going to be using the ash pan to set my solid fuel tablet on. Now, there is a different way of using the ash pan than we've shown so far, and that is in the back plate of the stove, as well as the front plate, there is another slot right there intended for use with the ash pan and solid fuel. So in order to do that, uh, there's a couple of ways I could do it. I could hold the ash pan in place, put the front on. I find it easier to assemble the stove without either plate, without the plate. Get it lined up, get it locked into place. Without a pan in there, I find that it can be a little bit more challenging just lining the tabs up. There we go. All right, all locked into place. Now there's no pan inside of it all, but I can work my fingers down inside to slide that back tab into the slot on the back of the stove, as you can see I'm doing, and then just push down on the other side and the front tab will rest inside the lower part of the feed port opening. So now my plate is inserted and it's at a good depth. Let's see, the depth now is one and three quarters inches between the plate and when I have a pot support on top. So that's a really good height for using with solid fuel. So I use the solid plate. Yes, you could use the fire grate, but I, my, my testing, what I found is that if you include more air around the Esbit tab when you sit it inside, the tablet will last longer and burn maybe a little slower, but last longer, as I said, and you're likely to get more likely to get to the full boil that you're looking for. So there's what it would look like with the Esbit tab sitting inside. I have an alternative fuel I'm just starting to play with. I just wanted to show you. This is from the Fire Dragon. The Fire Dragon clean and solid, green and clean solid fuel. So it is a gel tablet. So it's a crossover between using a gel and a solid fuel. Uh, I can't report on them yet because I haven't used them enough to really give you any kind of an indication of, of performance. I'll probably do that at some point in the future. If you want to use this with a gel fuel, you can do that, like the Fire Dragon or something else. What you're going to need is some little type of a cup to hold the gel fuel in. You're not going to pour it directly on. A little bowl, a little cup, a little uh, aluminum foil, little tiny plate that you get for cupcakes or something like that will all work. You can make a cup out of foil whatever you want to hold the amount of alcohol or gel alcohol you want to use. All right, so that's now using it with wood, with alcohol, with esbit or other solid fuels. Let's talk about using it with wood pellets. Okay, so once again, I've partially disassembled the stove and I'm going to reassemble it now with the ash or the fire grate in its original position. So now with the stove in, in its original configuration, you have, look at the holes in the bottom, the perfect grate for using wood pellets. The holes are just smaller than the wood pellets are, which means you're not going to lose any out, but you've got enough airflow to use wood pellets very effectively in the stove. I can get one cup of wood pellets in level with the top of that window. So one full cup, maybe just a little bit below the window. So yes, you could get a little bit more in, but I'll tell you, one foot one full cup of hardwood pellets will burn for 27 minutes in this stove. Uh, that's that's good performance, really, and it's uh, you know it's good usable heat the entire time. There's perfect airflow all the way through it. One little trick I used to get them ignited a little faster, something I picked up off of Steve at the firebox stove, is I poured them in at an angle so that I had a slope from the back towards the front window. Now that it you know you can't get more pellets in that way, but what that does it pre it presents more surface area of pellets to the air moving in across them. So as you light it with whatever you're using, if it's alcohol, gel alcohol, or, or other fire starters, the pellets seem to engage a little bit quicker. Uh, that means you just get to putting your pot on a little bit quicker as well. Ultimately though, you're not getting any extra burn time out of it or any additional pellets in the stove. So that works well, 27 minutes, that's pretty impressive. So the last thing I want to do is just talk about using it with charcoal. So quickly, I'm going to disassemble the stove. You can use either the fire grate or the ash pan for this. Depends on how much heat and how quickly you want that the charcoal to be consumed. But let's say I use the ash pan, put it in the ash pan slots at the bottom of the stove. Now, I can get 
comfortably seven briquettes. That, and I use the briquettes. I, I do prefer to use char chunk charcoal, but briquettes are a known size that most people buy, like the Kingsford brand uh, charcoal briquettes. I can get seven briquettes in there comfortably, and I'll have quite an extended burn time. Having that plate in the bottom does somewhat, not a lot, but does somewhat restrict airflow into the, or into the charcoal, so it slows it down. But there's still plenty of air coming in from the bottom on either side. So it works really well with charcoal. Okay, what I think I have done at this point is given you a pretty exhaustive overview of how you can use this stove with wood, with alcohol, with esbit or other solid fuels or gel fuels, with wood pellets and charcoal. So why don't we put some of this into practice. Let's take the stove out into the woods and have a fire in it. Okay, so I have the bush box set up in a fire pit today, and that's just simply for the reason of protecting it from the wind. So it's, it is a beautiful day here in Nova Scotia. It's hovering right around the freezing mark. It is sunny, as you can see, but it is a bit breezy. So that's, uh, again, the reason I have it set up. So the only demonstration we're going to be doing today out here in the woods with the stove is a simple fire built in the stove, assembled the way it is intended to be used. And it occurs to me that there is an added benefit... It, using it in the original mode that I may not have talked about on the tabletop. And that is the fire pit itself, it, the soil underneath, or the, its uh, mineral earth, is uh, quite damp from the rain that we've had recently. And normally that's a negative for fires. That's why quite often you build fires on a wood base to protect it from the moisture. But the ash pan is going to serve that purpose here. So while the ash pan does protect the ground from coals falling through, it also protects the fire from the moisture being drawn up into it. So let's get this started. So nothing very fancy today. I have some tiny splits here, and which will eventually be added. Some larger splits, but using a fire plug get it pulled apart here a little bit so that I can get it lit. I do have some birch bark I could use here but I think just to get this going a little quicker nothing beats these fire plugs for working out very quickly. So a little bit of split birch. It's quite old. It's a bit spalted in fact. But I think it'll be enough to work here. So what I may en end up doing is as I get the fire started with these smaller splits of uh, birch and as the flames catch on I think I, I may just cut away for a few minutes just to get the wood a chance to catch on. Then I'll start feeding the larger pieces of wood on. I have two pots that I want to put on top of this just to demonstrate a large pot and a small pot. And so I can show you if there's any difference in using either. Because uh, one of the complaints I've heard, of course, and I looked at this and I wondered if it would be uh, a problem, is will I get enough ventilation at the top of the stove for... Uh, air to exhaust so that it doesn't get too smoky, it doesn't dampen the fire down too much. And what I have discovered is it is so well designed because there are air holes all the way around the top that even though the pot stands sit a little low on top, it does allow for just enough airflow to not cause a lot of smoke. However, I do find that larger pots are more likely to cause smoke than our smaller pots. All right, so. So here's a demonstration. The stick I just put in is about 8 inches long. As you can see, it is probably just on the outside of being too long or just right for use in the stove. So I do have to watch because they can fall out. But of course, you never leave a small stove like this alone, or any stove for that matter, alone while it's burning. But it's catching on the way that I wanted it to. All right, the stove's only been going for, I don't know, three or four minutes now, and I've just put in a few pieces of hardwood. You can see that's uh, that piece of maple. I think it's going to be too long, but if I keep an eye on it, uh, then I can always just continue to push them into the stove. So, fire's going well. Let's put a pot on. So the first pot I'm going to put on is a small pot. This is my Tom Shoe Titanium Pot. So it's the 750 mil. They're, you know, they're small diameter pot. You wouldn't expect any problem from this. Make sure it's not full of pine needles on top of the stove. And it doesn't. It doesn't cause any problem. It's a good match for a stove of this size. Again, remember to match your stove to your pot and to what your needs are. So as a one-person stove, this is ideal. And of course, that smaller pot is, is great for boil up for uh, cooking a small meal or making tea or coffee. 
So very little, if any, smoke being caused by putting the pot on top. And I think the only smoke is what's coming from some damper wood that's inside. So again, just watch to make sure everything is moving in and not falling out. Yeah, that works well. All right, let's take that one off. And the larger pot that I'm going to be using today is the Pathfinder bush pot. I wanted to bring a larger pot with me today because I am going to be cooking a bit of a larger meal for myself. So you can see this is a much bigger pot to be putting on a stove like this. This is as big as pot as you're going to be, you ever probably want to put on a small stove or a stove this small anyway. And uh, it's still no smoke, really. Nothing that wasn't being generated from below. Yeah. Look how well that fire is burning in there. Good airflow. Minimal dampening. Yes, there is a little bit. I'll, I'll admit there is a little bit of dampening I can see happening, but very little dampening. Okay, well, I've got a pot on for, of water for to boil. Why don't I make use of that and make myself uh, some lunch? So once again, this is the Bushcraft Essentials Bushbach Outdoor Pocket Stove, the original stove from Bushcraft Essentials. You know, I've heard people complain that this stove is too small, and as I mentioned before, the answer to that is too small for what? I think you saw today that it works extremely well, both with small pots and large pots. It is a small stove. It does require a feeding more than a lot of other stoves. Larger stoves might require, but uh, that's what you get with smaller stoves. You do have to just keep feeding the wood into them but it, it performed extremely well. The other thing and the other comment I had heard and I was a little concerned about myself as I mentioned was was there enough room at the top for exhaust ventilation to allow air to come out so the pots wouldn't dampen down the stove and create a lot of smoke. Well as, as you can see there is plenty of ventilation all around the top even though the pot stands only stick out about an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch off the top that was more than enough to ventilate the stove both with a small pot as well as a large pot as I showed in the demonstration. Okay, also I mentioned that I was only going to do one demonstration with this stove today in its original configuration. And what I thought is I would do more demonstrations in later videos using it in some of those alternative configurations I mentioned earlier in the video. All right, if you have any comments on the the original Bush Box pocket stove or any questions about it, please put those in the comments section below. If you're interested in knowing where you can purchase this, I'll put that information as well as the specifications for the stove in the video description. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.